Hello, I'm Matt with Inside Durango TV, and today I'm here with Judge Reinhold, and uh, we're going to do a little sit-down with him. Hi, Judge. Hey. Thanks hi. for coming out to oh, our little film festival. Delighted to be here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how the festival organizers got you to come out and talk to you and why you're here with us? Well, Joni Frotten is no slouch. She got, uh, a lot of people don't know about the Academy's Visiting Artist Program and the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science. I know the Oscars and all of that, but all that money is that, that, is, um, that they make for those ad buys during that show that sometimes is seen by two billion people, that all goes into film preservation. And they strike new prints from, sometimes from movies that are on celluloid that are just turning into dust. Mm -hmm. And so they're really about, the Academy is, He's certainly about the Oscars, but that's how they in, infuse their their main concern was is film preservation. They also have a visiting artist program to celebrate and support film. So they will fly you for um, festivals that don't have an airline sponsor, and that's kind of crucial if you want to grow. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's hard sometimes, but uh, they'll fly you for free, and um, under the uh, banner of the the uh, the academy and Joni found this out and so she flew me in and but the condition is is I got to show one of my films that's not my condition that's the academy's and then I just have to talk a little bit about what the academy really does so I'm a guest of the academy but I'm also a guest of the Durango Film Festival because once the academy drops me off at the airport I'm on my own right. so then Joni picks me up <laughs> and so that's how it works cool. but what's really great is that a lot of people don't know about the visiting artist program you can have really really great people come and bring a movie um, for free for for no airfare so yeah I was it, totally unaware of that <laughs> yeah yeah awesome. I don't know why they're not they don't promote it more about yeah, well, very interesting. Well, and you brought mm -hmm. Fast Times with you. Is that, is that the film that you're going to screen for the Academy? That was, that was the request. Okay. And so, I mean, Fast <laughs> Times, huge movie. Did it a long yeah. time ago. Did you think at the time when you did it that you get the careers everybody from that movie has gone on to have? Did you ever think yeah. it would blow up like that? No, no. It was just a group of very um, excited actors. Be and, and, you know, Porky's and American, oh, none of those movies had been made mm -hmm. and the reason why we thought we were in something special is because it all came out of a year that Cameron Crowe, the, who at that time was uh, the youngest looking journalist at Rolling Stone, right. was hired to do an expose on um, being, a, uh, he masqueraded as a senior in a, in a Long Beach high school mm -hmm. for a whole year and then uh, wrote this book that um, before it was even out, um, Universal picked up uh, as, a, as a movie script and he developed a script. So as far as we were concerned, we were doing something authentic because everything that happens in the movie is something that Cameron had witnessed during that year. Right, okay. Sometimes, maybe Spicoli is an amalgamation of four different people, right. but everything actually happened. And knowing that, we were real excited, you know, because we, you always want to be in something authentic, you know. Yeah. So it, uh, it attracted um, some, some talented people. Well, speaking of Cameron Crowe, Cameron's one of my favorite filmmakers, <laughs> director, almost famous. You mentioned, kind of oh, follows yeah. that storyline a little bit. Um, did you get to have any interaction with him on set? Was he there? Oh, he he was so delighted. Cameron was so delighted with the casting, and that made us feel so good. Yeah. You know, and he was just, elect he was just delighted. Right. He was delighted with how things were going. He couldn't have been more supportive. And he regaled us with stories of great rock and roll stories where he was able to travel with bands that um, no other um, journalist was able to travel with because they, you know, he just looked like a kid. Right. And so Led <laughs> Zeppelin would take him under their arm and stuff. So he was full of stories. Yeah. And um, he did some writing, some punch up work when we needed it. And um, yeah, it was great. And then uh, to kind of spill the beans, most people know his girlfriend, Nancy um, Wilson, who is considered, a lot of people don't know, one of the finest guitarists, male or female, in, in the business. She's the, 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 the cute blonde that pulls up next to me on the road oh, really? in, in the Corvette. And it was right before they got married. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, and speaking of fast times, do you have a favorite memory from set? Anything particular happened that just stands out to you, or 
just not being able to wait to get to work. Right. You know, <laughs> feeling that we were doing something special. Yeah. And that Cameron gave me the license to come up with lines when, like, a line I'm, I'm proud of that's become kind of iconic is when Spicoli won't put his shirt on in the, in the restaurant. And, and I say, you see that sign? You know, learn it, know it, live it. You mm -hmm. know, well, Cameron had left me with, he wasn't there and he left me with some dead space. So I had to fill it, right? And people will remember that line. So it's kind of fun to have been allowed to have my own input and, and have it live on. But yeah. <clears throat> the wildest thing is that Universal has just recently re-released it for a limited theat theatrical release and not just midnight shows. And um, I'm, just, I'm just amazed by that because it's multi-generational. Yeah. I don't think it's dated as much as other movies, other 80s movies are dated. It's yeah. basically going to school, being obsessed with sex, and, and how to make some money after school. Right. <laughs> and that hasn't really changed. No. And so um, they re-release it as, they re-release it almost every year on DVD, but to give it a theatrical release again, yeah, of course I don't, get a pen, I don't get a penny. <laughs> you know, but so somebody says to me, well, man, 73 cents, you know, it's like 1981, I get a, residual check for 73 cents right. and somebody says, sell it on eBay for two, 200, man. I said, it's too cheesy. That's a little cheesy. It's yeah, a good idea yeah. though. I know, but. If you're ever that hard up. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, um, well, great. Um, well, I want to move on from, from that and uh, we briefly talked about it before we started, but you, I went to North Carolina School of the Arts. You were talking about, you did a summer session there. Can yeah. you talk to me a little bit about how that um, shaped you as a performer and, and kind of where you became? I was working at the Burt Reynolds Dinner Theater, you know, and um, which was which was really great because um, even though it's a dinner theater, we had some terrific. Uh, I saw the great character actor Vincent Gardenia and the great Julie Harris, who died recently, do Death of a Salesman. I mean, it was not dinner theater fair, you right. know, but they were terrific productions, and it helped me get real serious about saying, "Gosh, I really, yeah, I think I want to do it." So um, my dad staked me to go up to North Carolina School of the Arts for a summer where I had my first real um, exposure to, um, even though I'd been working with those folks down there, there were people that were actively work, working on Broadway and they, they weren't so much films at that time. Right. But um, it was a very important summer for me, Yeah. you know. Uh, we did Sam Shepard plays. We did stuff that I'd never find at the Burt Reynolds Dinner right, Theater. Right. So it was a chance to really be challenged. Were yeah. you primarily, did you feel like you were wanting to do only theater? Did film just sort of come up? Or were you always wanting to do both? Uh, you know what? I, that's all I knew. That's yeah. all I was doing. I was just, I was, I, was, I was literally applying for Southern Liberal Arts Colleges based on their play, the plays that they were doing. <laughs> I didn't care about graduating. I yeah. wanted to play that part or this part. And, you know, when I got it, I'd stick around. So yeah. um, uh, that was my primary concern was just to keep working. Yeah. So then I went back to Burt Reynolds and I, I met these uh, very talented um, actors and Hollywood reprobates. And rather than be um, repelled, I was just more interested in... <laughs> <laughs> and they were very supportive. They said, we think, you know, we think you've got it. So yeah. I went out there just as the movie Animal House mm -hmm. um, opened. So there was this whole new genre of youth-oriented comedies. And within a year, I was in Stripes. So nice. it was good timing. Yeah, that's me. great timing. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's the way it works, right? Yeah, Beverly Hills Cop wasn't a comedy. It was a Sylvester Stallone vehicle. He was the top Paramount star at the time because of Rocky. Mm -hmm. He had a bungalow on the lot and everything. And um, it was a story of a cop from the wrong side of the tracks that comes to L.A. to avenge the death of his friend, uh, meets a young rookie who gets brutally murdered in, that, in the third act, makes Sly even more vengeful, right? right? Well, he took it on himself. He's a good writer. He wrote Rocky, you know. Yeah. He took it on himself. I'll try to keep, condense this story. He took it on himself to write the sequence driving down Rodeo Drive, the most, you know, exclusive real yeah. estate in the world, smashing into Bentleys and Rolls Royces <laughs> and stuff. And so Michael Eisner and Jeff Katzenberg freaked out because they have their biggest star, but they're like, we can't do this. This is astronomical. And so Jeffrey says, well, we have that script Cobra. You know, how can we tell Sly no? 
you know. Well, he didn't. He said, hey, Sly, we have this script called Cobra. We really think it's better for you, right? He said, yeah, I like it. Suddenly, I have this great role. I was cast before Eddie, you know, yeah. but I'm out, you know. Who's going to be in it? And suddenly I was in an Eddie Murphy movie, but it wasn't a comedy. Yeah. So we had to rewrite ourselves through. Wow. That was a little unnerving. It wasn't for Eddie because yeah. that was his thing. But um, the stuff with my partner, John Ashton, and I in the car on the stakeouts, we improvised that stuff. And then Sam Simon came in, who later um, created The Simpsons, and he was our punch-up guy. So we'd work every morning to make it a comedy as we right. went along. That's, so it was an funny. action comedy, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you've been in the industry for about 30 years or so, yeah. roughly. Can't lie about that. <laughs> have, um, how have you seen it evolve to the days of you know, big studios and strictly TV to now the internet age and a lot right. of smaller indies coming out? Um, can um, about evolve that or revolve. <laughs> uh, no. um, uh, yeah, it's a transitional time. It's a difficult time. It's like the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. um, the studios are making su such fewer movies because they're interested in big global releases. Right. So you're going to open in, they want to open in Shanghai, New York, Moscow, Paris the same day. Right. It cuts down on piracy. Right. But um, the, the budgets are astronomical, and then they pay twice as much for, to advertise. So right. there's less movies being made studio-wise. But because of pay-per-view and video on demand, they need content. They yeah. can't sit around and wait. So for independent producers, it's a, it's a, it's a better time to make a deal because they really need content. So if you have a good movie um, that has... There's, the talent pool's out there because they're making fewer movies. There's more people yeah. available to work. So if you, if you write a really good script that's going to attract talent, you can get a deal. So that part's good. Yeah. You know, but it's gone to the days when I was coming up. There was a lot of German money infusing the studio system. Um, they were just making more movies. Yeah. You know, the typical budget was, I don't know, well, Beverly Hills Cop costs like, Fifteen million dollars, maybe twenty. Yeah, you know, That's think cheap. of what <laughs> if you did Beverly Hills Cop Four with Jerry. It's, I hope it's not too much, but it'll probably be like eighty million bucks yeah. or something. You know. Yeah. Well, I uh, appreciate you taking time oh, to talk sure. with us. Oh, sure.